Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall, and today I have Dr. Pad Davidson on the, uh, Pat Davidson even, Pad, I uh, don't even know where I pulled that one from, uh, on the show, and I'm very happy to have him on. Um, I have kind of been following bits and pieces of his works here and there. Uh, I don't know where I first came across Pat from, but uh, one of those people who you see enough and you realize, really, this person speaks very well says some very intelligent things, but also I like Pat because he sometimes, uh, I think you say it how it is and you really kind of, uh, you're not worried about stepping on anyone's toes in a, in a, in a positive sense, really, uh, because you have some strong opinions, but I think warranted strong opinions. But to give Pat a further introduction, he has a PhD in exercise physiology, so is an incredibly bright individual. He's an author, lecturer, and strength and conditioning coach. Uh, and I kind of wanted to start, Pat, because maybe some of the audience aren't fully aware of you and kind of what and, and where you are right now. Kind of what got you to where you are today and kind of uh, what are you most passionate about in the fitness industry at the moment? Sure. And uh, for anybody listening, yes, that's a fire engine. I'm in New York City. So, um, you know, that's that's the short answer is is I, I uh, work out of New York City and um, I on my day to day, I, I do personal training with, with general population clients. And, um, I also, you know, I, I do a bunch of things. People ask me, Hey, what do you do for work? And I'm like, Oh no, how do I begin to <laughs> answer this? But, um, a little background and then a little bit about like what I'm currently doing. I, I'd be happy to provide that. Um, you know, I, I got formally involved with education, uh, with educating myself in the, in the sphere of exercise science in 2004. You know, prior to that, I had been an athlete, like I had played um, baseball and football over here, and I played baseball in college a little bit. I did very poorly academically uh, in my freshman year, and, and I just basically like flunked out of school my first go around, and um, and it kind of ended my baseball dreams and ended my, my sort of like very immature 18-year-old uh, educational experience. I, I kind of reassembled my pieces and, and got an undergraduate degree in history, actually, um, which was very different than exercise science. I was planning on probably teaching history at a high school level and, um, and maybe coaching sports in high school. And it's just interesting, you know, timing is always uh, a powerful driver of, of like what's going to end up happening in your life. But when I graduated with a, a history degree and an education and a minor in education, there were there was a hiring freeze due to like you know just the financial uh, financial issues in that time period, and so I, you know I was just kind of like at home where I grew up in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and um, and doing what a lot of people do, just working a blue collar job, and um, and kind of struggling to tell you the truth. I was still involved with training and competing in um, in jujitsu, submission wrestling, and mixed martial arts at the time. And uh, you know, my coach was kind of like, "Hey, you know, I, I I don't really get why you're doing this whole history thing. Like, I don't know anybody that likes to train as much as you do, and um, you know, you really have studied like the the science of training and." You know, you, you really do a lot of work with diet to make make weight for your for weight class stuff. And, you know, have you ever thought about actually like working in in exercise as a career pathway? And it was one of those sorts of like, huh, no, I hadn't even really considered that. But um, it was like, well, I got nothing to lose. And that actually sounds great. So at that time, I, I went back and I started a grad school program and you know, I had done well enough academically to be able to just randomly kind of pre-qualify uh, at this school for this master's program, even though my undergraduate had nothing to do with it. Uh, so I was able to, to get into a strength and conditioning master's program, and I just found it to be enthralling. And it was like, you know, I was a good student when it came to history, but all of a sudden it was like, wow, I'm reading about stuff that I actually really love. And the more that I read, the more fascinated I become. And it's useful for me in what I'm trying to get out of it in terms of like, 
enhancing my own athletic performance and moving my, my, uh, you know, jujitsu game to other levels and all that kind of stuff. And, and really it was like the first time that I truly fell in love with something and wanted to pursue it with a hundred percent of me going into it. Uh, you know, I probably had done that with sports, but it was like applying that same sort of drive and love towards education and learning. And, you know, I was very fortunate to have a great um, major professor who ran the strength and conditioning program that I was in. And she had done her PhD at Springfield College. And basically I just wanted to completely model myself after her and end up doing what she did career-wise. So I, I, I went to Springfield College and got a PhD in uh, exercise physiology there. And following that, I worked in, in um, academics for about six years uh, at Brooklyn College in New York first. And then I went back to Springfield College for three years there. And, you know, I, I was in, in many ways trying to do what my, my master's professor was doing. You know, I, at Brooklyn College, I started uh, a weight room, basically. And I was having the students in there and basically, you know, not during official class times, but just like having, like I, I kind of built it, you know, in a, in sort of a, um, a collegiate strength and conditioning sort of a, a way, like we had some platforms and we had uh, plyo boxes and med balls and, um, you know, the basics basically, you know, um, we had a calf raise machine that we turned into a sled that we would bring out onto the, the turf field. And, you know, I just got these kids in there and we trained pretty much every day. And we went through all of the fundamentals of, you know, like uh, developing movement skills, developing, um, you know, plyometric abilities, power with medicine balls. Uh, so running, jumping, throwing, lifting, changing directions, all of those, those sorts of fundamental elements that would go into the development of, of the athletes that you would work with. But I, you know, for me, I always felt like I had to physically do these things to really make them make sense. And that's how I always wanted to teach as well was that, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to have you in the classroom, but I would also like to have this time in the weight room with you. And we're going to do this stuff. Like we're going to train, I'll, I'll write the programs. We're going to do the programs and we're going to live it. And, and that's what we were doing at Brooklyn college. We had a really great group. And, um, and many of those kids I'm still in touch with now, um, a, a lot of them have done really great things in their careers. And I still hear messages from them now about how, how they love that experience and what we called the pit, which was the name for our weight room down there. I went back to Springfield college after that, which was a, a career stop that I thought would be the final one for me to tell you the truth. I really thought like, Hey, this is, this is the place for me. You know, the school is, referred to as the cradle of coaches. We have some legendary people that have come out of that school that have been very influential in, in the strength and conditioning world. And, you know, I wanted to be the professor that would be able to guide this next generation of, of fitness professionals and strength and conditioning coaches. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't a great fit within that uh, group of faculty. You know, I think I was coming in too aggressive, too, you know, not listening and cooperating with other people. I, you know, I, I, I kind of know now about myself, I'm fairly unemployable and, um, okay. you know, I'm, I'm going to do things the way that I'm going to do them. And in many ways, like that's not a great personality profile, uh, for someone that's going to be an employee. So, you know, I kind of ran myself out of uh, out of town pretty quickly there. But while I was there, you know, we started something called Team Iron Sports, which was a mixed group of competitors from uh, mostly the sport of strongman. But we also had power lifters and uh, weightlifters and crossfitters and bodybuilders that were part of this team. Uh, and, and I, I coached them and I also competed in strongman during my time there as well. Um, and we had roughly, I believe, uh, somewhere around 20 participants the first year and then like 38 or 40 the second year. 
and it was really starting to grow. Uh, it was a, a very, like the group that came out of there is a very impressive group now. Uh, you know, probably the, the highest level competitor to come out of that group is Rob Kearney. And, um, you know, he's, I believe he, he just tied the world record for the log clean and press. Um, you know, he's competed for the world's strongest man competition multiple times. He's been, you know, he's, he, he lives at the top of the food chain and strongman uh, competing with, you know, the likes of the mountain. And, and he's done so while being really a, a, an undersized competitor. But, you know, uh, he, he's probably the most prominent, but the Hadge brothers are also extremely prominent members still in the sport of strongman that came out of that team. Uh, those guys have, are, are also competing professionally at the highest level. And, um, you know, they're, they're right there at, at near the top of the food chain. And, you know, it was interesting while I was there, we, we, uh, we went into the strongman national championships, the amateur national championships here in the United States. And, uh, you know, our first year, I believe, uh, I, I can't remember. I know that the second year we had uh, multiple national champions uh, emerge from that and that we sent multiple competitors to compete in the world championships at the Arnold um, and it was great, you know, like I, I was able to, to compete in, in those situations with, with the athletes. And, um, and in some, like our, our second year, uh, I, I competed against two of our, our, of our other athletes at the world championships, which was a pretty incredible experience. You know, we had three guys in the, it was kind of a combined weight class uh, at 185 pounds. They pulled the guys from 200 and they pulled the guys from 175 and met in the middle. But, um, you know, like, I think I ended up doing the worst out of any of our guys um, in that, but it was, it's a hell of an experience when you have um, three teammates all making it to that level and, and competing, not, not just against our, each other, but against athletes from all over the world. And um, so it was a very, very special experience to have these guys in the classroom uh, amongst the, all the other students to have a team experience where we would, you know, travel together, compete together, train together, eat lunch together. Uh, there's a very strong bond that still exists amongst the members of that team. And, and I loved it. I just thought like, Hey, this is what it should be all about. You know, I'm, I'm as a professor, I don't feel like I'm above any of the students. I will show my merit in the classroom by teaching the best information possible and delivering a very challenging coursework, uh, course workload. And uh, I'll let that speak for itself. And, and at the same time, I'm going to get in there and I'll physically do everything with you. Uh, I'm not above you. I'm simply another person that's going to go through a training experience. And I'm going to put my best foot forward in terms of designing programs for you guys. And, uh, and we're going to tr see what works and what doesn't work. We'll use evidence-based approach with everything, but at a certain point, we'll allow logistics and the results we're getting to drive what we're doing as well. And, uh, and so I, I loved it. Uh, leaving Springfield College, I came to New York for, for some interesting business opportunities. And since then, I've, I've just been here largely working as just an independent business entity and um, you know, having written three books now since being in New York, and uh, creating, um, you know, now a, a lecture series uh, of, of rethinking the big patterns, which is, you know, it, its own sort of model and, and uh, will turn into a certification system that I hope is very useful for coaches. But um, yeah, I, I do a lot of things. You know, I, I train people. I just launched an online uh, training uh, thing that's kind of a community-based online training group with you know, video footage of, of me doing the workouts with, uh, with Kate Georgiatis, who I work with, who, who sh she and I are both doing this together and, and interacting with our community. Uh, you know, I've done mentorship things. I've, you know, just, just a lot of stuff, you know, yeah. it's like, I'm, I'm pretty busy. I can, I'm constantly trying to do new projects and, and, and see, see how to interact best with, with, um, 
overall like the fitness community yeah and uh and simultaneously use that as a business approach but it, like my business is my life is my passion is you know it's it's everything for me so you know that's that's kind of like where i am now and sort of where i came from yeah it's really nice to hear about kind of especially people like yourself who are up there in terms of like i guess where a lot of trainers will look up to someone like yourself at the level that you've got to and it's always nice to hear if how people have got where they have a lot of people just assume oh you must have been in the thick of it from like birth like you just knew this is what you wanted to be but i think a lot of people are surprised to find that like they get into this through a passion like you always just would love doing and participating and it sounds like over your career you almost moved it so that you could still do that whilst educating and ultimately i can see why that makes you a great coach because i know like the best coaches are those who are very kind of educated but also in the thick of it because there's a big difference between like practice and kind of just in the lab and literature and things like this. So uh, it's really cool to hear yeah, where you've got to. And I guess being self-employed is the best thing for you right now. Yeah, I don't think there's any going back <laughs> at this point in time. It's it's difficult. I think, I think a lot of guys in our, in our field end up that way. It's like, but for me, it's oftentimes like, I can't stand like uh, policies and procedures, largely like in corporate structures that, that oftentimes make no sense, but you have to right. follow regardless without thought or anything behind it. And it's like, uh, why are we even doing it this way? There's like a million other ways we could do this. And I'm, I'm kind of unwilling to just go along with this. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I will die on this hill to reject this notion that this is the only way out of pure, like spite in some instances. And, and I, I just know that that's like, it, it just, for whatever reason, it doesn't fly. You, a lot of times you can't question things or, or do things differently. It's like, no, this is the way it's done. Why? Because this is the policy. Why yeah. is that? So you just end up in these, these nasty loops that I, um, I have certain obstinate and defiant characteristics that, that are bad fit for. Yeah. I think that's part of what is attractive of you as a kind of individual in the industry is that you see things that maybe are spoken about as told as truths or kind of this is just a normal feature of a program or what what have you and kind of you can almost call out the the bullshit that doesn't sit well with you in that sense um and i know i, I mean after doing a bit of research like into what you kind of enjoy and different bits and pieces biomechanics is something you're quite passionate about uh and i don't know obviously you said you've worked with bodybuilders and kind of i'm sure the athletes also go for hypertrophy and that's a big big feature of this podcast so i'd love to hear kind of what you see a lot of people doing like if there's any general things you often see in people trying to grow uh just common mistakes they might make to tr trying to grow various muscle groups biomechanically oh yeah no i'd be happy to talk about that it's it, like it's really interesting to me like in this sort of new new era of fitness in some ways because i think back like you know, I started working out, like I, I started lifting weights in 1994. And it's like, I, I originally learned about lifting weights from ESPN shows on fitness. You know, at that time, there was like, they had aerobic shows, and they had bodybuilding shows. And, you know, we, we would have sports highlights. And then after that, they would like transition to the fitness shows. And, and back then, ESPN used to have uh, they would have the Olympia on. They would show some weightlifting, uh, but they also had like the aerobics championships and like the, you know, it's, you see like memes about it now, like the people right. kicking and yeah. they look like they're <laughs> like, on speed or something like that. But those were like featured as like shows back in the day. And, um, you know, but, but for me, like, you know, playing baseball and football, it's like those athletes, like now, especially baseball, you kind of look back and you're like, oh, it's like the peak of the steroid era. But, you know, at 14 years old, looking at this sort of stuff, and even younger, you know, 92, being 12 years old, and like, it, it was emerging, like, you get the Bash brothers, Mark McGuire, and Jose Canseco, and these other guys just getting jacked. So it's kind of like, well, if, if I'm going to be the best baseball player I possibly can be, I better get really muscular. Uh, that's clearly like the path towards becoming uh, a professional baseball player and an all-star level professional baseball player. And then right after that, you get the bodybuilding shows that come on. So it's like, oh, I just do this. And then I become that. Um, and it's funny, like, like, I think back, like, 
I think there was like the Sean Ray show was on there and they had, you know, other like Flex Wheeler would be on there and Frank Zane and all those kinds of guys. And then the other show was body shaping and had uh, Big Rick and Dr. Pete were like the two guys. And then it would have the aerobics people. Uh, but, you know, that's that was my introduction to it. And and oftentimes what you would see would be, you know, um, kind of the basics in, in, in a lot of ways, like yeah. you know, squats, uh, stiff legged deadlifts as, as kind of like, you know, front side of the legs, back side of the legs, leg press paired with uh, leg extensions, um, you know, just just those sorts of things, uh, all the different upper body things, uh, forced reps, supersets, paired things. Uh, classical sorts of, of big compound movements paired with single joint movements and guys working really hard. And, um, that, you know, so, so that was kind of the beginning for me. Uh, and I just copied as many of those things as I possibly could. I got, you know, muscle and fitness magazines and, and anything else to be able to, to pick up concepts from, but this notion of like, Hey, it better be a compound lift multi-joint sort of a thing uh was embedded in me right from the beginning and then um the nutrition part too like just <coughs> excuse me um you know eating eating enough food uh, multiple you know like many meals a day uh, uh you know carbohydrates and proteins included in the same meals with uh with fairly limited fat sources and you know, looking at, at different bodybuilders, sample diets and magazines and stuff like that. And uh, I can remember being like maybe 14 or 15 years old and saving up money uh, to be able to buy metric supplements, the little packets when they first came out. Yeah. And boy, was that a disappointing thing to drink the first time. They've come a long way with the flavors and the, and the, the, the drinks. But, you know, I, I like I think about it, 94 is a long time ago now. Like right. I've been lifting weights a long time and um you know i've sort of seen some of these transitions and and now it's kind of like you know it, it, it's like mobility everyone you know mobility stability are, are these buzzwords that sort of began in in probably the early 2000s and have gained traction and and now there's just so many different schools of like how to go about trying to increase range of motion and um, all of these different either, you know, static approaches or dynamic approaches towards it with, uh, and, and Instagram has certainly uh, driven that as well with, with, you know, just pages that are devoted to just increasing mobility. And, and really like I, I got into the biomechanics stuff um, you know, again, like my, my background was more starting from there as a pure meathead athlete, sort of staying that route for a long time, uh, you know, kind of going through like, like Mike Boyle over here is kind of laid out like he, I don't know if it's still applicable anymore, but the evolution of a strength coach where you kind of start as a bodybuilder and then you learn about power lifting because you see somebody really strong at the gym. And then you all of a sudden learn about weightlifting and then after you go through this, this transition from bodybuilding to powerlifting to weightlifting, then you eventually hurt yourself. And then you have to learn about movement-based approaches. And after you've done that, then you get into like kind of understanding holistic program design and how it all fits together. And I think that that very much applies to, to my background and my history and, and really anybody that's my age, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 41 this Friday. So, you know, it, it really perfectly matches the timeline that I kind of went through in my evolution to where I am today. And, and I don't know if that's the same for people that might be, uh, you know, 15 years younger than me now, because I do know a number of people in that age group that work in the same facility as me and that, that work in New York City in the fitness world. It's, it's almost like they've, they've been on a different sort of trajectory. That, that I'm not as familiar with. Like they almost can't come up with the mobility first sort of a yeah. thing. And it's like they've, they, they don't have the background of, of um, starting with more like muscular development or things, you know, to me, it was always like, what's your 40 time? What's your vertical jump? Uh, you know, how much can you power clean? What's your squat? What's your bench press? 
you know, those are those are the classical sorts of of measuring sticks that I was more uh, coming from from uh, what's what's good sort of a, a thing. And now it's almost people are like, well, how much door supply do you have? And um, you know, anyways, I, I don't want to. Uh, I, I just want to give that as kind of like the background I was coming from, but but I did become fairly obsessed with the the thought processes uh, coming out of the realms of physical therapy and and people that were truly very intelligent about anatomy, functional anatomy, applied human movement, and I, I really went into um, a long time pursuit of understanding all of that material starting really from mike boyle talking about it getting into gray cook going from gray cook into kind of the czech practitioners that a lot of his information comes from namely vladimir yonda uh learning you know really everything about the yonda approach uh learning about dns dynamic uh, neuromuscular stabilization then getting into this track of PRI, the Postural Restoration Institute, uh, really working a lot with, with guys like Bill Hartman and his, his tree of coaches. And, and also just for me, just reading, reading books and, mm -hmm. and having a, a good foundational background of anatomy and physiology. You know, I, I mean, I've taught cadaver dissection labs before. I've got a solid just textbook background of all that sort of stuff. But, um, you know, I, I really, there's like, to me, I, I, you know, I, I just finished writing this book, which is called the coach's guide to optimizing movement. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was like, that was a three year project for me that I finished just a couple months ago. And, you know, I, I was trying to take all of this information that had taken me really since I started this pursuit in 2004 of, of really beginning to really learn all of this stuff. So from 2004 all the way to 2020 is the time period that it took me to learn this material. And then it took me three years, the last three years to basically take all of it and consolidate it into what has become a book. So it's, it's, it's not like, you know, I just snapped my fingers and overnight I was like, oh, I'm, you know, dorsiflexion is the secret to squatting. It's yeah. like, no, I like it. I really tried to take everything that I learned and bring it into a model that is workable and useful for coaches that uh, considers so many different factors and schools of thought and fundamentals of anatomy that it's it's it almost is a disservice to the book that the book is is only it doesn't have all the backstory that that went into what the book is like and 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 it i wrote the book because i just felt as though any preceding books in this area were just extremely limited and ultimately not useful for any coach that wants to be able to systematize this and truly drive reproducible results. So, you know, when I was writing kind of the end stages of this book or beginning to do, you know, promos or commercials, it was almost like, why would anybody get this? What is the, what's the big deal about this book? And I just kept thinking, like I kept going back to the same kind of comparison that to me, I think there's great practitioners in the realms of nutrition and program design, which are a little bit more like the elder statesmen of the exercise science world, you know, and, and I think about kind of like, you know, the, the guys from Renaissance Periodization or, or other people like, like Elaine Norton, when they have to make an app that, that guides you through, you know, when to eat, what to eat, how much to eat, all that sort of stuff. There's so much background knowledge that goes into giving those recommendations that it's probably insane to try to comprehend. Like in the amount of schooling you have to go through, the amount of practical applied uh, experience you have to uh, uh, dealt with um, 
you know, the logistical planning that you would have to understand to have incorporated in this. And then it's like, you get this app that's very useful and seemingly pretty easy to, to use. And it's like, and then other people will be like, well, I just use my fitness pal. And it's like, yeah, I don't know if that's really the same thing as this thing that's coming from a much more sophisticated group of people that have probably considered a million times more nuanced information and come to this place where the factors involved with this particular app are going to really be the big rocks that will consistently lead people to the promised land for the goal that they punch into it um, as the desired outcome that they're looking for. So, you know, I, I was like trying to make that comparison. Like, you know, there's so much stuff swirling around in the world of exercise people that talk about movement, that it's just noise. It's like a chaotic storm of, of like swooshing noise in every direction where you can't really seem to find a coherent model that actually filters everything out, gives you uh, essentially kind of a rule book with an explanation behind why these rules actually exist and will probably be, uh, like from a probabilistic standpoint, if you are trying to improve your movement proficiency in a specific realm, this will take you to the promised land uh, in a coordinated, systematic manner. Whereas I don't think, like I literally don't think there is anything else out there that has that is this it's it's just like what is it you know what other books is it like it's not like anything else it's the first of its kind and and i hope that it spawns off others of its kind and um but but as of now i don't think that there is a, a comparison to it and and I, I i really do think that as as influential well rounded, well-read exercise professionals, if they see this thing, I think they'll know what it is. Right. And I hope that it from there is able to spread because I really feel like uh, there is something to this topic of movement quality and being able to help people optimize the way in which they, you know, like how would a, like a, like I, I think of the sport of like high diving you know, which is completely based on how well did you get into the positions associated with the dive that you're executing? And they break it down in slow motion film. And it's like, you see, the reason this guy made this big splash is because he didn't have his legs tucked all the way into his stomach, you know, and they probably know a million reasons in the sport, but their language is not anatomical language. It's not, uh, you know, exact, it, it's, it's in the language of, of high diving. Or in the sport of golf, it's like, hey, why did this person slice this ball? Well, you can see the, you know, the 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 body lean angle. They they came too upright too soon in the swing, and they the the shaft angle was too shallow. Blah 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 blah. And if, unless you speak golf, you don't know what the hell they're talking about. Yeah. Whereas this is uh, really just like language that is defined. Uh, it's given sort of like you know, at least an operational definition within the confines of this. And it, it should make sense when people go through it and be, be something that is, again, reproducible, understandable, and accurate. So it's, you know, and, and it's hard because look, this is a 185,000 word book that covers what I consider to be these seven fundamental pillars that define the operational way to go through uh, categorizing, uh, appraising, and developing trainable human movement uh, with, with a very systematic and standardized approach to it. That, that prior to this, it's almost like we've had the, the world of the ambiguous sort of movement guru that makes up their own terms and uh, tries to almost mystify with, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't even know what's like, like human movement tricks 
or uh, you know, it, operating in a silo, odd vacuum proofs of of improving movement without having any objective sort of 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 clarity uh, associated with it. Hey, Pascal here. I just wanted to take the moment to talk about our membership site. Inside, you'll find a thriving forum, an extensive exercise library, courses, presentations, and research reviews. All I need you to do is hit the link in the description below and sign up. Really interesting to hear and also nice to hear the comparison behind the apps because I think a lot of people similar to yourself will be like, I mean, my fitness pal might work for someone, but only if they have all the knowledge that app almost has, <laughs> uh, which is a quite a lot of knowledge considering who it's coming from. And uh, I see it very similar in terms of what you're two are talking about there in terms of movement where like the, like the, there is different people kind of know what's happening, but they can't describe it in a way that they like everyone can understand, whereas you're kind of formalizing that. And out of interest, do you have like a, is the book targeted towards a specific kind of person? Is there anyone like an audience you, it's most suited towards? Yeah, you know, it's always a funny thing. Like as I've done these projects, uh, I've gotten advice from different people. And usually the advice that you hear on almost any product that you try to sell to consumers is do you have an avatar? Who is the target audience that this belongs to? And, uh, I, you know, I have a client that I, I train who's, uh, you know, he's been a, a multiple time New York Times bestselling author. And, and I, was, I was having a conversation with him about this because I felt like the advice that I was getting from the majority of people didn't make sense to me. I was like, you know, I, I don't get it. Like, I don't think like there's something in me that says that uh, intuitively thinking about a target audience for a book doesn't make sense to me. I just like, I want to write the best book about this topic that I can. And quite honestly, I'm writing it for me. I want to write the best book for me that I can possibly write. And he, he goes, you know what? Like, honestly, like I've talked to a lot of other authors that are much more successful than I am. And they have, like, he's like, the, like, it's not in books or it's not in textbooks. Not in these. This is actually the approach that we all use now as well. That the avatar is yourself first. If you write a book that you find interesting, chances are that someone else will find it interesting as well. And if someone like, so it's almost like that's sort of the way that that he recommended and that was my feel for it as well and it, you know maybe i'm just operating purely from a confirmation bias standpoint of boy this feels good i feel like i had the right idea but but that's honestly what i did like i in many ways i i know that the process of taking my own sort of um implicit knowledge and making it explicit knowledge uh has always been the way that I feel like I can reach mastery in any topic. You know, I, I've always found that I learn best by teaching. And when I teach, I have to break topics down to a level that I feel like is understandable to anyone who is willing to have focused attention and truly listen or read and put the, like, if it's clear and someone can, it, like, not always easy, but if it's clear and someone puts the time in, they can 100% understand exactly what I'm saying. Uh, and by going through that process myself, and, and, and quite honestly, it's, it's, it's not an easy process. Like when you think about like, you know, cause I think about how would I explain this to a hardworking eight-year-old in some ways? Like I'm gonna use that language and I'm going to be so thorough from A all the way to Z like every single step of the way, I can't miss a step because if I give them any wrong direction, they get lost in the process. You know, every time I've done that, in the aftermath of doing that, I feel like my command of the material has been elevated a thousandfold. And, and so again, like I was doing this for me and I'm my own cross-examining attorney while I'm doing these sorts of things. You know, it's almost like I'm writing it, I'm explaining it. And then it's like, I stop and I think to myself, is there a hole in your presentation? Is there a flaw in your logic? And I try to tear it apart myself. And I feel like if I can pass my own scrutiny, if I'm really diligent about the scrutiny, it'll make it through any scrutiny. And if 
I like the way that it flows and reads, well, then I think somebody else is going to like the way that it flows and it reads. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have to get other feedback on it. But to me, the notion of actually writing something or creating something for a specific demographic, in some ways, I think misses the, the most I don't know, the, just the best approach that you could possibly go with. And I, I think that you have to start with yourself and whether or not you really like this thing. Write it for yourself first and then maybe have somebody else come in and put their own spin on it, which is what happened with this book as well with an editor who I think did an amazing job. And um, she did not come from the same background that I do, you know, uh, and so when she didn't understand something, it was a great piece to be like, oh, okay, this needs to be totally reworked. And like, when, then she would try to explain it in her words. And I'd be like, ah, uh, well, you've got kind of this part okay, but like, this is totally not the way that this it should be coming across over here. So it led to a really good collaborative end product, I think, uh, that, that filled in some of the holes that, that I might have missed from the perspective of I'm just so into that world that oftentimes I have assumptions that other people are like, whoa, I don't even know what this is the beginning of this is. No, for sure. I think I, I completely agree. I think especially it will come across to the listener or the reader rather. If you're passionate about it, that will come across and it will just be a better read and it's better information overall. And I was just yeah. trying to gather whether or not thinking about for the audience that are listening here in terms of like their goal is often like maximal hypertrophy and i think biomechanics is becoming more and more widespread in terms of oh yeah. like we might be able to do something like this to hit this specific area of the muscle or how this person saying this this person saying that they seem to mm -hmm. like not agree with one another and i'm thinking does this book kind of give that person a, a bit of an answer and a way to go about those sort of things so that's a great question and, and I don't think it gives that answer, okay? I think that what this book does, I've, I've kind of compared it in the following way, okay? I think this will, analogy hopefully makes sense. And, and you might have, uh, I don't know how many European listeners you have, so it might not be the perfect one, but in American football, uh, every offense has an offensive coordinator who creates a playbook for the team of all the plays that they're going to run, okay? So imagine if I took every team in the history of American football and every offensive coordinator's playbook, and I put it all on a giant wall behind us, okay? And I said, this is the totality of the plays that are available in American football. Uh, that would be a terrible playbook for any singular team to use. In many ways, it's too many options, okay? The book that I wrote is the totality of plays available. You know, it's the totality of exercise options and the kind of the underpinnings of at least what I believe is mechanistically going on with them. So I think that what you're asking about is almost like, uh, like I wrote step one of this process. Here's everything that exists. And here's sort of like the, the mechanistic underpinning of what actually drives movement, just movement, pure and simple. And then, of course, I break it down and I've got 13 motor patterns of training, uh, you know, and, and the big fitness ones being kind of like uh, locomotion, triple extension, uh, change direction, throwing. Uh, hip dominant movements, knee dominant movements, vertical pushing, vertical pulling, horizontal pushing, horizontal pulling. And then I got three other ones that are like breathing core exercises for the pelvis, core exercises for the thorax. So it's like a, a, a taxonomy, a, a giant backdrop of all available training movements. And, it, you know, it's broken up into, you know, the planes and different stances that you could be in to execute those things from. Uh, and from there, it, it kind of gets into you know, what I consider to be checkpoints as to whether or not you're performing things competently that are based on uh, uh, like a visual examination of where the body parts are relative to each other and a sensory feedback system 
of saying like, hey, if you feel these particular uh, bony landmarks and these muscles, then you're doing, for instance, a sagittal plane drill with competency, okay? And if you feel these things, it's incompetent. And if you're in the incompetent list uh, group, like here's a troubleshooting guide to bring you back towards competency. Okay. And, and there's something like that that exists for, you know, sagittal, frontal, and transverse plane drills. And, and then from there, it kind of gets into these other realms of, um, you know, what's called movement strategies, muscular orientations, and muscular actions, which to me are the more mechanistic realms of, of defining movement. And, um, you know, it, like strategies are involved. There's two of those, it's expansion and compression. And, it, you know, expansion is, is, is basically, uh, it's, it's associated with yielding and accepting and absorbing. And there's uh, stereotypical joint actions that correspond to that, uh, which are flexion, abduction, external rotation, supination and plantar flexion as your major ones and then for compression which is more in the realm of like your overcoming uh movement and your production of force uh you know that is you know the opposite joint actions of uh internal rotation and extension and adduction and pronation and dorsiflexion and and the argument being that that those are actually all the same movement, believe it or not. It's, it's, they're, they're, the skeleton provides these, these bony constraints that give direction. And, and we, we, we use names to try to define those directions, but the directions only emerge because of the interlocking way in which the different segments sort of merge and fit together. But overall, you're either trying to expand or compress. Um, and it's almost like your, your compression is your gas pedal and your expansion is your, are your brakes in some ways. Uh, and, and then that you have these you know, two states that the muscle can be in, which is an eccentric lengthened state or a concentric shortened state. And that you know, the, the muscles can be doing two things. They can be yielding and accepting or uh, they can be overcoming and producing and and that these things like tend to ride together but also that they can do these things from different states as well like there's these sort of dynamic ways and as as for instances um you know there's like imagine somebody jump roping okay so if we're, i were to examine the ankle and the you know the gastroc uh and soleus complex involved with it this would be, if I'm, if I'm evaluating the action of jumping rope, okay? In this model, it would be described as a triple extension motor pattern that is performed in the sagittal plane. Uh, from a quantitative breakdown perspective, it is low load, it is moderate velocity, and it is moderate to long duration. From there, uh, you know, I would, then get into this realm of it will alternate back and forth between yielding and overcoming muscular actions okay while i'm landing and accepting force i'm yielding when i'm propelling myself up i'm overcoming from a muscular orientation standpoint i'm always in a concentric shortened orientation of those tissues, okay? This is the kind of differentiation and distinguishment that I'm getting at with this book. And here's, the, here's kind of the kicker that we're getting to from like a describing movement and the mechanisms of movement. When I'm jumping rope, I want to feature minimal range of motion at the ankle. You know what I mean? I don't wanna go flat footed. I don't wanna to go to a position of dorsiflexion. I want to remain in plantar flexion the entire time, the entire time that I'm yielding and the entire time that I'm overcoming. Uh, if I stay in a concentric orientation of those tissues while I'm yielding, that will minimize range of motion. If I were to allow those muscles to reach an eccentric orientation 
during the yielding phase, that is what allows for more range of motion in the yielding direction. On the flip side of that, when I'm trying to create my overcoming action, I can, I can overcome from an eccentric orientation. It's entirely possible, but I'll never reach the peak of range of motion in the overcoming direction unless I switch over into a concentric orientation. Okay. So it's kind of like th those are, these are the step one things. And, and for jumping rope, I don't want to go into a large range of yielding. So I need to maintain concentric orientation of the relevant tissues while I'm yielding. That will allow for shortened time in the yielding direction and shortened motion in the yielding direction. That's the mechanistic backdrop of that, which allows me to have all these physiological presentations of things that people would call uh, musculotendinous stiffness um, being present for elastic uh, you know, absorption and creation during a plyometric activity. But the thing is, it's like you cannot have a plyometric activity unless you maintain a concentric orientation on the yield. That's, that's, that's where it gets to. It's like, th this is the backstory of all the things that you want. So when you get into the realm of hypertrophy, there's some things that we kind of know about as being associated with training methods that lead to a hypertrophy response, okay? Like uh, some of the big basics, there needs to be a proximity to failure with the set, okay? which has nothing to do with the biomechanics part of it, really. It's like effort. Did you try hard? Did you, did you get to at least like, I don't know, three reps in reserve of, of this set? If you, if you were 10 reps in reserve, forget it. Like it's, it's never going to happen. Okay. But some of the other things that we know about are that range of motion does seem to be a, a feature, like exercises that feature more range of motion tend to actually drive a better hypertrophy response. You know, like when you examine squatting, you're probably, it seems as though if you use less load, but actually go through a full range of motion, you're going to have a better hypertrophy response than adding significantly more weight and utilizing very limited range of motion. So if you want to be able to reach a large range of motion during a squat, what you would have to do is you would at some point, like you have to yield on the way down and you have to overcome on the way up. If you're going to get into a full range of motion on the yield, the relevant muscles, namely the, the quadriceps and the glutes are going to need to reach an eccentric orientation for you to be able to get to the bottom of the exercise. Now, I would argue that it's namely the tissues of the pelvic floor that are actually the primary ones in this instance that will guide you in the right direction. And, and look like coordinated movement is about maintaining a concentric orientation of some tissues to block movement on a yield in one direction while reaching an eccentric orientation of the tissues in the relevant direction that you're trying to yield a great deal into. So, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time discussing the different regions of the pelvic floor and that I'm trying to create a concentric orientation of the posterior pelvic floor that's near the coccyx while I create an eccentric orientation of the anterior pelvic floor when I'm trying to squat full range of motion. Okay, because it's a vertical displacement movement of the pelvis as opposed to a horizontal displacement movement of the pelvis when I'm deadlifting, which is the opposite presentation where I want an eccentric posterior pelvic floor and a concentric anterior pelvic floor. It, whatever direction I reach eccentric direction, eccentric orientation in is the direction I'll be able to move in a large range of motion towards on the yield. If people are like, you know, I go to 90 degrees in a squat and I get stuck, it must be my dorsiflexion. I'm like, I, I don't think it is. I would bet the house that it's more factors associated with the axial skeleton. And on a squat, the pelvis is the king. 
And it's probably the anterior pelvic floor that's unable to reach an eccentric orientation. And you're probably like somebody that sits way back, but can't sit straight down. You know, that, that's my guess. So you're blaming dorsiflexion because, you know, you're witnessing it there and you're saying, hey, look, see the shin angle staying straight up and down. And I'm like, yeah, well, the, the pelvis is just displacing so far backwards. The pelvis can't displace down. And, and of course you can't witness dorsiflexion uh, taking place, but it's a consequence, not a driver, okay? Um, but essentially every movement has this coordination of eccentric in one direction, concentric somewhere else, and the construction of this three-dimensional sort of a thing leads to the, what you witness as external movement taking place. Uh, it's, you know, within this, it's kind of like each pattern requires its own discussion yeah. to tell what's going on, particularly at the level of the axial skeleton and the anatomy of those things. You know, when I get into the knee dominant chapter, this is the, the framework of the discussion. And when I get into the hip dominant chapter, this is the framework of the discussion is that these are the primary factors at play. And, and here are the things that alter these presentations of eccentric orientation, concentric orientation of the different parts of the pelvic floor. Here are coaching cues to try to uh, provide those things. So it's, it's not like I'm just saying like, oh, it's this abstract concept that you've never heard of about the pelvic floor. And you're like, hey man, like I came here because I want to lift weights and grow tissue. Like I didn't come here because I want to know about Kegels. And, and that's not the point here. The point here is that, look, like what I'm saying is that uh, larger range of motion exercises are probably a better choice for hypertrophy than smaller range of motion exercises. You know, uh, mechanical work that reaches proximity to failure, increasing the volume of that over time is probably the stimulus that leads to the greatest hypertrophy response that you can reach for your genetics. Mechanical work is going to be uh, this combination of, of force times distance. You know, the force is going to be the weight that you're using. But to me, the, 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 the major biomechanics piece of this is the distance component. How do you go about allowing for greater distance? And where is the distance coming from? You know, you can, you can create distance through all means of potentially compensatory activity, but that compensatory activity can probably add up over time and, um, and bite you in the ass uh, to the point where now you're, you're, you're probably uh, inflamed or you just have achy things that, that needn't be that inflamed and achy. Um, so, it's, it's not so much that I'm saying, uh, you know, here's this golden pathway to hypertrophy through a biomechanics lens. And like, if you want to like specifically, specifically target this, this amazing part of your posterior delt, you have to get into this magic position. It's not that so much. It's, it's more like, I, I think that you're still probably going to be better off sticking to the basics and, um, you know, uh, progressive overload and good quality, like, um, program design with Excel spreadsheets and, and following a systematic approach. But that, um, you know, the way in which you're executing the basic movements still has some potential to, to get more water out of those wells. Uh, and and the, the well can be deepened primarily through finding the cleaner approaches to increased range of motion for those exercises for hy for hypertrophy, mm. but also just that like it's a tricky thing because you know I, I don't think you're going to find a study that shows you know if you're if you move with less compensation you're going to find yourself less injured. It's too great of a time period. It would be similar to trying to to create the research that shows that smoking kills you. It's like you know, it's too, it's too slow of a process. Right. It's too drawn out over time. But I, I think in many ways, it's similar to like the waves, the, the way that water can lap up against a mountain and reshape the rocks over time. 
you know, um, if you can, you know, there's, there's a million variables involved with training for anything, sleep, lifestyle, nutrition, uh, mindset, biomechanics is one such piece of this puzzle and it, it occupies its own niche and its own realm. And it's one that I find to be important. And in many ways, it goes back to that old quote of like, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. And there's no reason to not learn some of the fundamental elements of what drives movement and how you can specifically alter it to fit your needs, yeah. okay? Uh, and if you understand the underlying essence of what you need to, to drive the adaptations for your sport, then this ultimately explains the way in which you alter the movement. Like that's really kind of it. Like if I'm training sprinters, I know that, you know, faster people go into less knee, hip and ankle flexion during their ground contact time. So I need to do everything possible to get them to have more concentric orientation during their yield. In contrast, you know, if I'm trying to, like bodybuilders over time will tend to have a harder and harder time getting into eccentric orientations. You know, it's, it's like the, the nature of lifting that much weight is compressive in general from a movement strategy. And compression is sort of the opposite of this expansion, yielding, accepting uh, approach. And it's like, you know, it's, it's like, if you're going to continue to make progress over time, you probably still need to be able to have those elements involved because it's going, if you lose those things, it's going to cause you to lose the ability to get into the greatest ranges that you can in the yield. And as a result of that, you're not going to experience a lot of the eccentric stress that's going to be associated with the mechanisms that will ultimately be, you know, in, in, in at the roots of protein synthesis. Uh, and so, so I, I, that's kind of, it's not a direct answer, which I kind of apologize for. That's all right. And my hopes, you know, is that I, I want there to be future uh, versions of this book. And I'm hoping that, that different experts from different realms inside of this thing, because it sprawls, it goes in a lot of directions. It goes from, you know, kettlebell training to weightlifting, to sprinting, to talking about doing chest supported rows. I mean, it really includes pretty much everything in here. Uh, and and trying to tease these things out, but I couldn't possibly be the most well-read person in the world about each and every one of those topics. Yeah. It was more that I wanted to try to put a holistic catalog together that simultaneously actually presented what I've been talking about in terms of what actually allows us to be able to present these different expressions of human movement. Uh, because the ballet dancer has this amazing ability to get into these eccentric orientations and to absorb with these incredible ranges of motion in the yielding direction and simultaneously present incredible range in the, in the overcoming direction. They can reach both full states of the muscle in the in the yielding eccentric direction and in the overcoming concentric direction. And at certain points we lose these things. And, and again, there's deeper explanations on what actually drives the expression of these things, but it's not just, you know, getting in there and throwing some bands around your, your, your legs and doing ankle rocks and, you know, oh, if I have dorsiflexion or if I do this drill with this PVC pipe, I'll magically be able to do overhead squats. It is, it is not that. It is really a more holistic explanation of the complete anatomy of the, of the human body, but then broken down, like I, I do provide you with an exact stepwise 
systematic approach that's principle based on start here. And here is my best guess at the best drill for this. And here is the pathway towards moving you into more and more sophisticated versions and greater challenges of expression of this particular realm of fitness and movement training. And every single area and box that you could try to check off in terms of movement possibility is included. Hi guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level. If you're interested, check the description and sign up. I think I, I think you answered, maybe didn't answer the specific question, but I think it gave the answer that people are looking for, at least I was, and it gave me a better understanding of what the book provides and that it is, like you said, it's very wide and broad and gives people that kind of, the initial understanding. And like you said, in future, you can go down rabbit holes of, I can make it like a very biomechanic, hypertrophy specific kind of sector here. But if you haven't, don't jump to that before you've got the understanding of everything here, because there will be people as there always are looking for that silver bullet of, they haven't actually got this understanding of, like you said, just good range of motion on the core basics and making sure they're doing enough volume, training hard and their jump for like the, the flashy thing that they're seeing, whatever influence they're doing, where it's targeting a specific area. And it's like, well, do you even have the understanding enough to know if that is going to be doing that thing for you? So uh, I think it, it sounds like it's going to be a really great book for a lot of people. Yeah, I, I, I do hope so. I, I think that in some ways, like when I'm speaking, I'm always, I, I never feel like I'm able to stay on the linear trajectory of the major points that I really want to make whenever I'm speaking. You know, like it, it tends to wander a little bit and I think overall I do a decent job, but never the job that I want it to be. Whereas in written fashion, it's like I had the ability to vet and go back yeah, yeah. and take my time. And it's like, it's presented exactly in the way that I want it to be. And it's there's so much time to be able to, for the user to be able to go in and fundamentally understand like, oh, I see. Okay. And this is how I use it. Excellent. Um, so, so I do think that this was written from the perspective of trying to provide the most utility possible yeah. uh, in this area. And, and it does, in fact, from the utility perspective, I do provide you know, exactly the right kind of, exactly what I would consider the best starting place for exercises and exactly kind of like, hey, these are the progressions that I would recommend based on these rules that consider a number of factors. Pat, do you have time for one more question? I know we're absolutely, yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not in a rush. Okay, here. cool. Yeah, I just because we've been talking about range of motion, I think it's become a little bit of a. And I've even had uh, people debate this on the podcast, and uh, you probably you follow Mike, so he's kind of talking about full range of motion, and he has his own perspectives on that. Where, where do you lie with kind of what do you, for hypertrophy purposes when you're talking about range of motion? How do you break that down? Do you break it down per exercise, per muscle group? Do you consider things like active, passive range? What, what's your philosophy there? So that's a, a really interesting topic to get into. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm almost obsessively objective, you know, like where I think that I, I get myself in trouble with people sometimes because people think I take things too far. I complain about body weight exercises because I feel like they're, they're, I don't, I, I think that they're going to be sloppy when it comes to being able to actually uh, track progress, um, you know, from the perspective of like, you know, I sweat a lot. I probably weigh four or five pounds less at the end of a workout than I do at the beginning of a workout. And if I, if I take five pounds off of a barbell, I can usually do it for two or three more reps compared to if, if those, if those little two and a half pound plates are, are, are on there versus off. Like sometimes it's a, it's a big difference. So, um, you know, uh, same thing, I think in range of motion, um, you know, I like what my, my main business plan going forward is a concept called strength score. And, you know, it, it began with, um, you know, the gym that I work at, I I've loved Kaiser equipment for a long time. You know, they use pneumatic equipment. They use pneumatic technology that's built into all their equipment. It ranges from 
from racks that have cables that are pneumatic that attach on to the, to the sleeves of the barbell to, you know, machines, leg press, overhead press, lap pull down. You know, they have a full line of, of equipment. It's all, all pneumatic, so it's air pressure based. And I had this idea uh, about five or six years ago, of I would love to build technology that I could slap onto the Kaiser and have it display my mechanical work per rep, per set, per workout, per training block, per annual training cycle, et cetera, et cetera. And I've built that model. Um, so in the gym, you know, we have a TV screen and it's hooked up to little computers that the team that I work with assembled. And it, it basically, it measures your work while you're doing your exercise. So as you're working out, like the screen is, is showing like, okay, you're 0 0.5, 1.1, 1.7, you finish your set, you've got 4.3. And so it factors in the load that you used and the total distance that you move the load through. And then you do your next set, you put it back in and it's got your next set building up 0.5, 1.1, 2.7, and you end up with a 4.4. And over here in this column, now it takes the first set and it adds the second set to it. So now you're at, uh, I don't know, 7.8, whatever you're at. And then, so you go through your whole workout, you see the set that you're currently doing being scored and you see your cumulative workout being scored over here. And, and so now when I work out, like, you know, I have my, my, my training plan that I follow and I've got my, my journal that I write all my stuff in, but I don't write, like I, I write in my, my exercise, I write in my weight, I write in my sets, but I also write in the strength score. And what it does is it keeps me honest with using the same range of motion every time. And what's amazing to me is I'm pretty diligent in general. You know, like I, I believe that I'm going to use about the same range of motion on every, every set, but I, I wasn't, I just wasn't uh, until you get that objective feedback. You know, I, I, I look at this thing, I call it weight room God. It sees everything that you do. It doesn't miss anything. And it's like, you think you made progress. It's like, hey, I made progress. I added five pounds compared to last week. And it's like, no, you didn't. Your score is down by 0.1. You moved the load less distance compared to last time. You deluded yourself into thinking you made progress, but you like, like your reps were 93% as far moved as the previous time. And it says it right there on that board and, and there's no one to argue with. And um, so to me, it's like, are you comparing apples to apples or have you now started comparing oranges into the mix? And, and this thing is just showing me how often I start throwing oranges and tomatoes into this, this apple comparison bucket and how wrong I am most of the time. And, uh, and I'll tell you, when that thing goes up, you've done something. You've made legitimate progress. And the other amazing thing is how much of a factor the distance is for the mechanical work that you do. It's like, you know, for the most part, you get all these debates in the hypertrophy world. Is it stimulatory reps? Is it total volume? What is it exactly that's driving the, the bus here? that's going to make muscles grow. Uh, regardless, like it's going to be a work-based variable that we're going to be utilizing and measuring. And we've really only been including 50% of the equation for work into the discussion. You know, this whole other realm of, of distance just hasn't been, nobody's measuring it really. You know, it's like, it's just, it's just assumed to be the same. And and I can tell you, like, when you just do almost anything you can, you, you increase that distance, what seems marginal to you, this score changes in a larger way than adding a little bit of weight. Uh, it, it's, it's very dramatic. And it also points out, like, um, you know, to me, it seems like, like in sports anyways, you, there's this old sort of thing, like, you know, the best guys in the weight room oftentimes aren't the guys – that start or the best players on the team and uh, the weight room coaches are always complaining, ah, this guy's not working that hard or something like that. You can see when the taller athletes and taller people are, are working out on this thing. Hey, their score is right there with the shorter guys using more weights, you know, more, more weight on the, but 
but they're moving it farther. Their mechanical work is usually the same or higher. It's usually higher to tell you the truth, even with less load. Um, you know, I, I was doing a leg press and the, the person I was training with is probably, you know, so they're substantially taller than me. It, them using it with 540 pounds for 15 reps was the same mechanical work as me using it with 700 pounds for 15 reps. Same strength score on there. And it's kind of like, well, I guess that makes sense because this person is in fact a better athlete than me. Every time we go out there on the field and do any kind of, uh, you know, recreational sports or anything like that. Like, I think it's demonstrating a little bit more reality. Uh, you know, I think about like CrossFit for instance, where it's like, who's going to win? Probably the guy that's really strong and fit that's short, you know, uh, over time, over all those reps, that mechanical work adds up, adds up, adds up. And if you don't have a good way of, of, of representing it or counting it, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that you're actually getting a true picture just by saying sets and reps and load uh, until you actually start featuring the distance. And it's simple, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not hooking up electrodes on people and like trying to get in there and, and uh, you know, tease out these tiny little mechanistic physiological differences. But it's like, uh, I, I can see it in clients, you know, people, first of all, people like it, you know what I mean? It gets competitive with yourself and, uh, and it gets competitive with other people. You're like, I can't let this guy beat me on this score. Like, I'm gonna work harder. I'll, I'll, I, will, I will move this thing further. I'll get every little millimeter out of this rep that I possibly can. You immediately feel the difference when you do that. There's an incredible amount of feedback on it. Uh, usually people lower the load because they're like, I can't actually get the same damn score when I try to go heavier because I'm cheating the range. They don't know that they are until they, they actually see a score and get some, some, some feedback on it. But um, I've had amazing results with the clients that I have. You know, just from like a body composition standpoint uh, with guys in their 40s, 50s and 60s, you know, those which is the majority of my clients is just like older guys that have enough money to pay for premium training. But, um, you know, like they're they're when you thought they were tapped out because I've been working with them for a while, we finally have this technology. All of a sudden you can see them make boom, these amazing gains in progress and finally, no matter how much you coach some people, like, hey, man, you could go to a little bit more range of motion. I don't have to say anything now. They immediately do that. Um, so to me, uh, I don't have, I'm not collecting data. I'm not publishing this or anything like that. But it's very apparent. And I do have clients that, that do collect their own data. I have a guy that just went and got a DEXA scan. And uh, I, you know, his, his lean body mass increased dramatically like you know i think something like seven pounds uh over the last like six or eight months or something like nice. that um with with this being kind of the thing that's newly featured for him um and and it's like we literally just allowed this thing to run our program design for us too it was like hey if your score keeps going up we're not going to change anything we're just going to keep running this until it plateaus and stays plateaued for a little bit and then we'll switch. Um, so it, it just, but from a purely range of motion standpoint, at least from the feedback I'm getting from this thing, boy, does it matter. It, it's just a, a dramatically powerful variable for this. Um, I was just saying that, that like, uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Mike Isretel and that I, I just find him to be a tremendously considerate person and you know weighing a lot of variables and i know how strongly he believes in, in range of motion as well as as a really critical factor for hypertrophy driven training and and i would say that that i'm with him as well and that that's probably an area that i people can really need to you know if quality rain and increase that progressively over time with the exercises that they're doing. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a, a really key ingredient for them to continue to make some, some adaptations with, um, with that being the factor that increases in their training design.
I love that. Uh, and I love the machine that you've developed because that a lot of people just use load and they assume or load and reps. And like you said, uh, the kind of total load that they're moving in tonnage and they assume range of motion is staying steady. But like you said, it's very easy for people to cheat that. I'm a big fan of exercises with, I call it kind of terminal consistency. So it's like you touch your chest and you lock out like it. There's nothing cheating that, but a lot of people, they will chase that load and they chase it, chase it, chase it week after week. And like you said, they haven't got the score in the machine that's giving them feedback like you have, and it's not keeping them humbled. So a lot of people think I don't know, more weight on the bar means I'm kind of providing more mechanical tension and more growth stimulus, but it could be completely counter. Yeah. And I'll tell you, like we, we have uh, some really cool future plans on this concept where it won't be locked in with, with Kaiser equipment and basically anybody that's got a phone would be able to use it awesome. in the future. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that it can get linked with other, other methods as well. I, I would love, because it'll measure your, your, your mechanical work. It'll measure what you actually did in your workouts. And I think if something like that can get linked with, um, you know, your diet apps, and with your other other you know quantifiable pieces of like you know heart rate and you know every everything else like it just makes it more accurate so you know hey if you if you went into the gym and you you did this workout and your total strength score was a 115.5 it equates to this many calories and it alters your macro breakdown by this much right. and it's just that much more dialed in so that you don't have to guess. And then it's like almost a 100% certainty that the results that you're looking for are going to be uh, given to you. And if you can increase the strength score and you're looking for, you know, an increase in, in, in lean body mass gains, then you can increase the, you know, your, your carbohydrate intake by this many, um, you know, grams uh, over the course and, and just dial that sucker in. So you have these corresponding things that feed into each other. Um, yeah, I mean, like that, that to me is, is really the future of this stuff. Sounds truly exciting, like <laughs> nerding out on that. And I've never tried actually Kaiser equipment, but I have had clients who have had access to it. Like so there's like Kaiser gyms and things that they've had access to. So yeah, I'd be interested to try some of that equipment as well, because it sounds pretty cool. It's very nice. I, I, I look at it as like uh it's kind of like driving a Rolls Royce compared to um, something else. It's so smooth. The air pressure is, is, uh, is really nice. Um, you know, to me, like, like I, I personally wouldn't really ever re want to have a primarily free weight based program anymore. Uh, you know, it just beats you, it beats you up. Yeah. Uh, it compared to just like that smooth, steady air that, um, you know, you can't, you can't, it's not it's just so much less work yeah well pat i want to say a massive thank you uh you've given me more of your time than uh, i ever could have hoped for and i think this has been really interesting and i'm gonna have to drag you back on for another one uh because i have some other kind of questions and i just kind of caught the cusp there of some interesting topics as well and i know everyone's going to have enjoyed this but i want to make sure if they want to find out more about you maybe find out about the book the online coaching where's the best place for them to head I've actually got everything running through Instagram at this point. Uh, my Instagram handle is at Dr. Pat Davidson, which is uh, DR period Pat Davidson. And, you know, I've got the bio link. It's got link tree. It takes you to basically a tab for everything that I offer. So it's, it's all in, in one place, which to me is easier at this point than websites and everything else. Perfect. Yeah, I'll uh, make sure that's linked below. And I can only recommend at least following Pat on there for some interesting, like there's always interesting discussions in the comment section and interesting ideas coming out from there as well. So yeah, thank you very much, Pat. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Pleasure. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course.
The Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people, uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is gonna be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there, you can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. It's also gonna be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.